Good morning, Thomas. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having agreed to an interview for the Meet Top Environmental Economy series. Uh, are you ready? Shall we get started? Yep, yep. Uh, could you please give me a brief background of yourself and your main research interests? Right. Well, I've uh, always taken quite a big interest in natural science. I, I, I did a bit of science uh, quite early on at school. And early on as a young person, I was also an activist, uh, an environmentalist. I was, uh, you know, campaigning against the nuclear power, against the uh, massive use of oil and coal and, and all kinds of other environmental issues. And uh, when I started studying economics, I found the tools uh, to really <clears throat> make a useful impact. And so I've kind of merged these interests, an interest for for interdisciplinary work and an interest for, for important issues in our time. Uh, I've also lived in, in a lot of countries. I'm interested in the world, interested in development. And so you know, sort of um, all these things have, have come together and um, um, worked a lot on environment in 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 developing countries, I wrote my thesis on Mexico and the um, the massive development of the oil sector when I lived in Mexico, and this has quite profound effects on the economy. So um, I um, I found that uh, fuel taxation is a really important policy instrument uh, that needs to be developed and uh, uh, to deal with with, for instance, climate change. Later in life, I started working on discounting, which is another really fundamental issue um, because it's, it's, it, it tries to capture our relationship between the present, between ourselves and the future. And, and some issues, in fact, many environmental issues like, like climate change uh, is a very long run issue. And so many of the costs and problems will come in the future. And the way in which we discount the future is is really essential. What article book of yours would you call your best? Uh, well, uh, it's a humbling question, uh, but um, there's one article uh, uh, or or a series of articles related to uh, climate and discounting. Uh, some work with Michael Howell uh, on um, on how to do discounting when when growth is different in different sectors, and I think. Uh, I mean, basically, discounting is a reflection of growth, largely. Uh, we would be rich in the future, therefore we should uh, discount. But the thing is that growth will be very different in different sectors. And so we need to do a, a discounting that is more complex and it takes into account the structural change in the future, the change in relative prices. And to put it simply, we need different discount rates in different sectors. And so I have here, for instance, a book on um, uh, fuel uh, economic, fuel prices and the poor. And this book is um, is intended to show that that the taxation of gasoline, which is a really important instrument to deal with climate change, it's not bad for the poor because people often say this. In fact, uh, people often it's it's the best argument there is against uh, higher gas taxes is that this would be bad for the poor. And it turns out it's not true. It's still quite an effective argument. Uh, but that's kind of the purpose of the book is to show that, in fact, particularly in poor countries, the poor don't use gasoline. So this is like a tax on on diamonds or perfume. It's actually a tax on, on things that the uh, that decide one and two, the richest people use. So it's a progressive tax. Yeah, nice. That you need to send me that book. <laughs> I will, I will indeed. <laughs> uh, if you had to give young researchers in environmental economics some advice, what would it be? Well, so I think it's it's important to um, <laughs> to stay broad, uh, uh, have a, a broad interest in real problems. Um, Often the opposite advice is given, you have to focus. And of course, there is some truth to that as well. And as an advisor, I, I, you know, I, I have to remind students it's probably good to get really good at one thing and then specialize in that. But, but my personal inclination is, is that it's important 
uh, to have a fairly broad uh, range of interests, both within economics and in other disciplines, because I think the cross fertilization of disciplines is important and and it's important. We have we have so many real problems. It's a pity if people write uh, like exercises on things that are not very important. Uh, we really need to focus on, on the big issues of, of our time. So you need to keep your curiosity alive and to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we are researchers. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, Thomas, you participated in COP21. Yeah. You are a member of the Scientific Council for sustainable development to the Swedish government. Uh, how is it for an economist to work together with politicians? <clears throat> well, if you really want to be effective, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, and it's an art in itself. I, I worked uh, for a year and a half at the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, which is a sort of an environmental almost like an environmental lobby in the United States. And they are really experts at this. I, I learned a lot there. Um, they, um, because what, what economists uh, and academics in general tend to do is we do our own research. And then at least some of us think, well, we should talk to the policymakers. And then afterwards, we sort of, we try to find a policymaker and say, well, do you want to come to my seminar? And <laughs> that's the wrong way around. Politicians have a very tight uh, uh, sort of timeline for their work. And there might be one year, one month, even one day when they uh, actually are, are, are interested in, in tax issues and uh, fiscal reform. And if you miss that opportunity, the year afterwards, they're not interested. Right? They, they, then they're working on something else. And we have to see what are the entry points? You know, uh, if they are working on a fiscal reform, then maybe coming up with a with a it's the right moment to come up with a carbon tax. You have to understand what the what the politician wants to do, and you have to uh, find the right moment and the right way to communicate. And, and you have to go to the politician. Um, it's no use just uh, inviting them to your seminars. Uh, that's that's too passive. I mean, it's better than nothing, right? uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's not a very effective way to begin. In what direction would you like to see environmental economics develop, and what would be the obstacles to this? Mm. So, um, environmental economics and well, economics in general is changing. There has been a radical uh, change since I started studying. Uh, at that time, we actually did. Uh, believe in the homo economicus and and sort of did you know like microeconomics by by the book uh, uh, since then we have integrated games here we have integrated behavioral economics political science and uh, and even interdisciplinary collaboration with with all, all kinds of other disciplines so the subject is 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 changing Drastically, and this is this is very exciting, and we we need more of this. Sometimes you could say that actually, while parts of the subject are the essence of the subject is moving in that direction, some of the institutions, for for instance, promotion and um, that kind of thing internally for young people, have not really caught up. So while a lot of people are doing interdisciplinary work, somehow the Inter interdisciplinary journals don't count so much in in evaluation. Uh, you know that's 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 a quite an important detail because I want to get you know I want to get the best students. I want the, those students to succeed, and then um, you know they go off and they publish a, an article in a good fisheries journal and it doesn't count. So that's you know that's a problem. Would you say environmental quality during the past fifty years has improved or not? I think that's a, that's a great question. In fact, I, I sometimes take that as a starting point in my lectures, um, because there's a, a lot of people. And in fact, I have a, a prominent colleague in, in, in Sweden who very often, sort of, uh, in his lectures, uh, used to say that um, 
environmentalists exaggerate and look how life quality is improving uh, in this country, that country, and all kinds of things are improving, literacy, life expectancy, health uh, in multiple countries. And it's true. But on the other hand, it's also true uh, that we are uh, running enormous risks when it comes to climate change and uh, biodiversity loss and a bunch of other issues. And the thing is, there's not a contradiction between these two. I think, in fact, they are closely related because a lot of what we call development and, in fact, what we call abatement and cleanup, environmental cleanup, is not solving problems, but moving them. Now, when we wash our hands, literally, we do not destroy the dirt. We move it from our hands and our body into the nearest lake. Or, or to the sea if we live by the coast, because we mix it with detergent and soap, uh, hot water, and we move all this through a pipe into the sea. So we have moved, uh, we, have, we have solved local problems and created really big global problems. Thomas, you're now 66 years old. Shouldn't you be retired by now? What keeps you going? There's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of work that really needs to be done still. Uh, we, we face serious policy changes and uh, uh, we face serious policy challenges and we need to do something about them. So I want to help contribute with that. Uh, at a personal level, I still enjoy work a lot. Uh, it's uh, it's almost like a hobby. Right? I, I, I am with my friends. I am doing fun things. I enjoy uh, looking at models and, and working them out. I enjoy looking at data and finding uh, new patterns, new solutions. I, I enjoy thinking about policy. I kind of enjoy writing papers and giving giving talks and so there's um there's not much reason